I want to tell you a story. It's a Game of Thrones story that is unfolding right now. It's a story of a king who is ousted by a bastard son. It's a story of basically corruption of the 1% over something created for the 99%. What I'm talking about is Ethereum. Ethereum is something that basically started way back in 2012. You didn't hear about it until it was launched in 2014. Back then, it was a small little startup called Small Planet. And it was Small Planet as in dot .net was the end of the domain. How do I know this? Well, basically, I started investigating a decentralized framework for launching collectives and collaborations back in 2009, September of 2009 to be exact. And ultimately, that happened because simply I was fed up from doing startups. I'd been doing them a long time. They just weren't working for me. And I looked in the mirror and I says, you know what? I ain't broken. So if I ain't broken, then the startup must be broken. And if the startup is broken, how would I fix it? That's how I got started in FoundUps. FoundUps started off simply as a founder with an idea for a start up, a found up. That was it. That was the first definition of FoundUps in 2009. Well, I was pretty shocked as I started to delve down into the startup. The first thing I realized, and I'm going to get to the story here, but here you got to hear some background, is that no one knew how to define a startup. That's right. You could go around and ask people around, all around you, what's a startup? What's a startup? They can't succinctly define what one is. And because of that, I had to come up with a definition. And actually, the startup, there are three stages to a startup. There is the pre-seed stage, which is when it's less than 100,000 in revenue. That's what I put a, a figure. And it has no accredited investors. I only have friends and family. There's very little traction on this stage. It's very slow. It's kind of like it's a lot of work. And 99.97% .97 of these, these ideas, business ideas, ideas for solving problems fail. And you may say, well, how do you get 99.97? Well, it's simple. We know statistically that 99% of business plans never see funding. That's right, 99%. So I, I figured it's probably generous to say a point, point 0.97 of all the others don't even have a business plan. I'm talking about like the hackathons. I'm talking about the, the startup weekends. I'm talking about, you know, the guy who just has an idea. I'm going to do this. A business plan? What's a business plan, right? So I think it's a fair and conservative guess to say that and it's probably 99.9997% fail, right? Fail to launch. And I should say fail to launch. They don't fail on a business sense because a lot of people will say, well, then it's not a startup, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into a debate here, but so that, that's why I say it just fails to launch. Now, the, state, the information that you will have heard is basically 90% of startups fail. Now, this is actually something that I started pushing way back in 2010. I was one of the first person to kind of push this paradigm because I found this data and I was like pushing, pushing, pushing. And finally, you know, after me kind of basically jabbing, jabbing the Dave McClure's and all these individuals are doing startups and say, listen, you know, you need to be telling people the truth. Um, the simple fact, they fail because they fail to scale. And what I mean by that is there's something in startups called compounded annual growth rate and they just fail to meet the expectations of the investors or they, or there could be other problems, but they basically they fail to scale. And that is the seed startups. Now these startups do have accredited investors. Accredited investors are people who are like the 1%, right? Um, and um, so they do have access to closed capital networks. Whereas basically the first ones don't other than basically going, you know, into severe debt yourself and ruining your credit and everything else, that does not count as access to closed capital networks. Going and destroying your, your, uh, your life because you have a, an idea is not, you know, is, is not what I'm talking about. And finally, the third stage of a startup is the seeded startup. And the seeded startup is the one that has the VC that gets back behind them. And it's gone through that stage, it's been passed on from the accredited investors to the VCs, there's, there's incredible traction going on, and ultimately, 
basically 75%, this is not my number of those fail. And you may say, well, gosh, how could 75% fail? They actually don't necessarily fail in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the real term of the word fail. They actually are scuttled or, you know, or released because ultimately they don't meet this compounded annual growth rate return, which is really a math. And, and any VC will tell you, show me the financial section. Just show me, that. I, don't, I don't care, don't, I don't care. Just show me that they'll, they'll flip, they'll, they'll flip, they'll ignore everything, just flip to the back. And what they're looking for is the CAGR. They're looking for the compounded annual growth rate. And if that rate meets within the investor's expectations and they're looking at all the, you know, all the basically the, the, the data behind it, um, then they will get behind it. But the moment that that startup ultimately doesn't do that, or and there's, a, there's lots of wars, there's lots of acquisitions, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a dirty war, okay, at that stage. Well, I would say the entire startup process is broken and it's a dirty war. Now, that's pretty bad, right? But it gets worse than that. And this is when the Occupy Wall Street um, movement started. I discovered this. Well, I realized that basically the underlying issue that, 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 that Occupy, you know, we are legion, are complaining about really are just systemic outcomes. And, and this actually applies to all the scientists, all the research. We're all trying to solve basically system, uh, outcomes of the problem. I can't say they're systemic because they're not systemic. They're endemic outcomes of the problem. Let me say that, endemic. Let's, what's systemic, what's endemic? Okay, let me take a side note here and explain that. Well, basically there's only two kinds of problems. There's systemic problems, which are the majority of problems, which means there's a problem in the system, right? The systemic, there's, you know, like uh, you have a flat tire. Well, that's a systemic problem. What's the solution? You plug the tire, you, you know. Um, now, if you can't plug the tire, like it's on the sidewall, now that's an endemic problem. An endemic problem cannot be fixed with a solution. So what do you have to do with the tire? You replace it. And that's the key, all right? And who alerted me to this actually was, you know, was uh, 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 Dave, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Suzuki, right? Um, who ultimately kept talking about this exponential growth and we can't have this exponential growth and blah, 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 blah. And I realized, I made the connection that basically what he's talking about is this thing called, and I searched, I was like, where is this exponential growth? And I know this 5%, but where does this come from? And it comes from something called compounded annual growth rate, which I've said before. So all of a sudden I came to this realization when Occupy was happening, it was very frustrating because I was like, dude, you guys are, don't, don't have it. These are just endemic outcomes of, a, of, a, of an endemic problem. You, 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 you can't fix the corporation, you can't fix climate change, you can't fix these things because ultimately they're, they're endemic outcomes of the underlying problem, which is we have an endemically flawed business model, which is built on this idea, and this is where it's flawed, it's very important that you get this, right? David gets this, is that you cannot have exponential growth on a finite resource planet without it ultimately collapsing. And the thing is, CAGR is so embedded in the entire one global economy that we cannot move this part out. It's impossible, right? The moment we move CAGR out of the system, basically everything crashes, everything whatsoever. Wall Street goes down, everything goes down, and we are, as a planet, are left there standing going, uh, what the fuck, what are we gonna do, right? So, so and there's a really good chart talk by the Zeithurst, the ZM movement. Uh, he asks you three questions, right? And it's if you go to my business plan, it's right at the top. And I, you know, he doesn't give me credit. No one gives me fucking credit. But I know because I've watched all his movies. Again, he spent most of his time talking about the um, the problem being basically, um, you know, these outcomes, right? And pointing out the problems instead of finding the solution, but finally Jonathan hits it on the head. And I was so excited to see that he finally figured it out. Um, and uh, 2000, what, 2016, that he finally figured it out. And I've been saying this since basically 2012. Um, he basically said that, hey, here's these three questions. Um, how would you fix the system? You know, how would you do this, right? Well, the trick is, is that the only question you can't answer is the first question, which is how do you fix the problem? Well, you have to replace it. Like, how do you fix that tire? Well. You, you can't plug it, you have to replace it. And that's what FoundUps is. FoundUps is basically a decentralized business model for the collaborative, for the co-op community that treats the world as one co-op. It treats the world as one thing, right? And the underlying structure that I pull together built on something called the blockchain basically ties it all together in a beautiful way, right? 
and I've made a little video that you can watch, which is Beach Boy, you know, very frustrated. He kind of wakes up one day, realizes he's old, and, and he's all this trash. And he's been cleaning up trash for 40 years, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse, and he's finally fed up. Well, it turns out that Beach Boy's also Anon's dad, right? And, um, and, he, and he hears that his son is actually pretty famous, so he goes off looking for him. But before he does that, he makes this video, right? Um, and he's trying to go find his son, Anon, in this Legion group, to, to, and he's bringing his, his friends along, called Kor, right? Kor, um, be one with Kor. Kor understands the problem. They understand that we need to usher in a new business paradigm shift. And ultimately, Kor is basically a bunch of old crotchety guys who had left and gone into the wilderness to spend their last days, are now forced to come back to fix all the mess that, that the younger generation has made. So that's Kor. So basically... Moving forward, right? Um, um, going back to 2012, I was fed up, and, and basically, I uh, I realized uh, because uh, um, basic statistics that there was no way in hell's chance that any investor was going to invest in found ups. Right? It's pretty disappointing, right? I kind of got I kind of got very fed up, and I've got a very popular video of mine. Um, where I'm just like cut off my head shaving like it is now. I shave my head, that's what I do when I decide to move to something else. And uh, I talk about permaculture. And I actually pivoted away and I said, screw this, I'm gonna go do permaculture. And, and I'm gonna basically talk to you, how did I come to this realization? It's really through the transitive property. And there's something called the law of diffusion and innovation. This law also applies to the law of customer adaptation. So I said if A equals B, right? then B equals C, right, and A equals D, right, that's transitive. I may have got it screwed up with the transitive property. So, so what, are the, what are the next two, right? So the next one that I came to, right, and it, this was the order, I said, well, there must be a law of investor, right, the law of investor that, um, uh, investments, right, or the law of, of, of basically these angels. So, and I realized that basically, and there was 3,000 angels at the time, so I did the math on it, it was 2.5% of 3,006. So, I realized I had six guys on 3,000. I'd have to somehow find the six guys, right? And one of those six guys, they're known as Leap of Faith. The Leap of Faith investor, same guy, for example, who got Google going. It was a Sun Microsystem guy. He goes, oh, I love this, and I'm going to put money in, into it. And there's lots and lots of examples of that. You know, people who just basically put it. And it actually is not the fact, the money that got Google going. It's the fact that he assigned himself to it. And most people miss that. It's, it's the alignment of basically a mover that gets innovation started. In found up success equals validated idea. And I actually actually experienced this, and I'm gonna talk about that real quick. Really, and this is also a thing that really, really confused me, right? And it took me a long, long time to realize that simple thing, that validation of basically an archangel, right? An archangel, and you'll hear me talk about an archangel. An archangel is basically someone who does leap of faith and someone who basically has standing that jumps out and gets behind your project. Now, I had that experience. And, and, I, and basically when I was, I need to stop saying basically, sorry about that. Um, back when I was at Florida State University, I was an acting student. Yes, I was an acting student. I did spend a little time in business school, but I didn't like selling widgets and I just left that crap. And I decided to go join the theater. And my dear friend, Michael Ritchie, if you listen to this, he used to call me the born again actor, right, Michael? Remember that, the born again actor? So, and I was, I was a born, I was passionate about it. I worked, I remember loved going in to the meetings with Michael and, and uh, I, I so wanted to get in the BFA program, but they just wouldn't let me in. And I just would try, 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 and finally they let me in, right? But, um, and it's only because, actually they let me in, only because I got accepted at the Royal National Theater in London, right? I was one of two undergraduates who applied for this program, and to my amazement, they let this fuck up in, right? They let me in, and it was an amazing time. I had lunch with Ian McKellen, Alan Rickman was there, you know, Anthony Hopkins was doing Sense and Sensibility, and it was like, it was like, you know, it was amazing, right? So when I came back, right, I was all crazy about theater and everything, and I was like, I'm going to get in the BFA program, and so I was going out to McClay Gardens, which is a beautiful, beautiful gardens out in, um, um, like, near, um, I can't think of the, the estate there, a really expensive estate, it's all grown up now, but the gardens are still there, and I was passionate, I would go out and I'd be doing Shakespeare, 
you know, I'd be like, uh, devouring time, blunt thou the lion's paws and burn the long lived phoenix in her blood, make time, blah, 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 right? You know, I would be just getting into it. Well, I didn't know at the time, but there was a mental hospital not too far from this part called uh, uh, Ch Chattanooga, Chattawitzka, Chatta something or other, Ch you know? Um, and basically the, God, I'm saying basically to it. So what happened was, um, my antics and my passion and my noise, I was just out there just kind of like letting it all flow in, just, just being one with nature, really didn't go over so well with some of the participants walking around who were trying to enjoy their serene thing. Um, and they kind of reported me to a police officer, and I can't remember, to a park ranger, which I, I, I feel bad I don't remember his name. Um, and he ultimately, I did actually, his name is in the program of the Southern Shakespeare Festival, uh, which I have on my website, which I can actually get. But, but uh, he um, ultimately um, said, you know, approached me, his hand was on his gun. And he's like, um, you know, kind of look at me like, is this guy going to like turn into a zombie or a, or a werewolf and like jump on me? And ultimately, um, I explained who I was. I was like, ah, I was a theater major. It's doing that. It's, I'm just, I just came back from it and came back from, uh, you know, acting in London and being part of this amazing program and just love Shakespeare. And he goes, why don't you do a show out here? I was like, that's an awesome idea. Why didn't I think of that? So that's what launched something called the Southern Shakespeare Festival. And then with the Southern Shakespeare Festival, Basically, ah, um, I, you know, I, I said to myself, well, who should I talk to about this idea? So like any guy, you go to the most, you know, you go to your VC. Now, I didn't know what a VC or anything else, but to me, a VC was the head of the school of theater. So I went to the head of the school of theater. It took me a while. I was really nervous. I was young. It was, you know, it was, it was uh, 1994. And I said, why don't, why don't we, um, you know, I finally met with Dean Lazier and, uh, you know, he's a formidable guy. And I said, sir, I said, I have an idea. Why don't we do free Shakespeare in the park? Joe Papp was, was a chair of us and we can do this event, right? And we can attract, I went to the National Theater. I could, I could reach out to the folks that you know, participated and get them to come over and we can have professional theater for the students. And he goes, no like good idea or anything. You know, nothing. He was like, I get 10 of those ideas a day. Really, that's what he said. I got 10 of these ideas a day. Uh, you know, bring me a proposal. Well, the guy, you know, I didn't know what was going on with him. It's like NBC. They don't have time for you. They like, just bring it to me in writing. There's, their head is so up their ass and everything else that, you know, but the thing was, what got me so fired up was the statement. I get 10 of these ideas a day. And I left his office thinking, what the fuck? If you get 10 of these ideas a day, why aren't you fucking doing them, right? What the heck is going on here? And I was angry. So as I walked out, I glanced up to the main, main stage theater, and there was this, this, you know, this is Fallon Theater. Fallon. Who is this Fallon, dude? I've heard of him. I've never had a class with him. I've, I've heard of him. He's a legend. He's the guy who founded the School of Theater. He's the guy who started the Oslo program. He's a giant. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go to him. You know, I'm not going to give up. And that's the key uh, 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 temperament. Of, a, of, a, of an innovator, right? Not an entrepreneur, but an innovator. An innovator is someone who sees a problem and just will not give up. Like I've spent seven years now on found ups and, and, and I will not give up on found ups because I know I'm right. I will just keep going and going and going until it happens, right? So I, I, I start looking for this guy. I can't find him. I go upstairs to all the teacher's labs. I'm looking at all the doors, he's not there. I mean, he is nowhere to be found. I said, how could the emeritus dean of the School of Theater not be found that I know he taught here? So I finally inquired to someone, I can't remember who it was. Um, I said, um, excuse me, you know, where, where's uh, 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 Dean Fallon's office? Um, and they're like, I don't know. So finally, I was like, wow, no one knows where his office is. So I finally go down to Lazier's office again and I asked the, the secretary, I said, excuse me, I'm trying to find um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Dean Fallon's office. Oh, he's in the annex. The annex, yeah, the building next door. Oh, I know the annex. I have classes in there. It's just this little dive of a place. Oh, he's, his office is in there, in the back there. So I go in there, and this is a grungy little student theater space, right? Really grungy. So I'm looking around. I walk all the way down the long hall into the back of the theater. I finally go in and say, well, I don't see where the heck he could be. And finally, I see a door. It's like a broom closet door size. I mean, it's a little door, and on it it says, Dean Fallon. And I think to myself, what the fuck? 
Here's the Dean Emeritus of the School of Theater, and he's in a broom closet. What the fuck's up with that shit? You know? But I'm like, okay, whatever. You know? I was like, that's not for me to worry about. So I signed on his door. I said, I would like to meet with you, right? I signed, you know, I'd like to meet with you. And, um, you know, he had open up. I could see where his open hours were. Um, and I showed up. And there was this guy. Uh, oh, dick. <laughs> Sorry. Let me pause this. All right, I'm composed. Mr. Fallon. I was like, you know, and there was this guy, and he was weathered, and he was leather, leatherly, and he was, he, you know, he kind of had this, this such a welcoming smile that just embraced you. And it was just like you could see he just had enlightenment and wisdom in his eyes, and it was, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced before. But I was scared. Huh. I was petrified. Because I'd gone through a horrible experience with Lazier, and uh, ultimately, I didn't know what was going to happen, right? So, and I figured, to be honest with you, that he was going to say no. So, I remember sitting down, and the room, we were, you know, I was a pretty big kid, and he was a big guy, and we were just sitting there, you know, crouched in the, in the room. And ultimately, uh, I start talking about this idea. You know, it's like, yeah, I want to do this festival, you know, Shakespeare, and we'd make it free in the park, and we'd bring in the Tallahassee and the FAMU, and we'd complement it with international artists that I know from the National Theater. I invite them to come. You know, I, I had, hey, I had master classes with Alan Rickman. I had lunch with, with Ian McKellen. You know, um, I could reach out to Michael Joyce. Um, God bless you. I mean, he's the late Michael Joyce. He's an amazing guy. Uh, I just want to say that. Um, and, um, you know, and you sit there and I, I must have gone on and on and on. I didn't know how to stop. I didn't, you know, and finally I, I was out of breath and, and there's this long pause. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And he goes, Michael, that's the most amazing idea I've ever heard. And not only that, it's something that I've wanted to do all my life. This is a way to bring the community back together. It's been too divided. And you have seen something that not even I have seen. This is amazing. This is really amazing. You know, I want to help you. And you, I about jumped out of my skin. I seriously, I was like, you know, I just, I think I probably turned white in shock when he said that. And he goes, and then, but he didn't stop. And, you know, before I could reply, he goes, but there's one thing, there's one thing, okay? Okay, I'm going to be there every step of the way, but you're going to do the walking. And I had no idea what he was talking about, right? I had no idea what he was, what he was mean by you would do the walking. But I thought to myself, dude, I can sprint. I can definitely walk. I said, yes, sir, I'll do the walking, sir. I will do it. And I left that room like I was on cloud nine. I was on the top of the world. I was going to change things. And basically, that was the momentum. That one interaction, that one event, that was the birth. That was the conception. That is the moment that the Southern Shakespeare Festival came about. And it wasn't because of money. It wasn't because of my ability, because I didn't know how to write a grant. I have never produced a show. I had never done anything like it, right? And that's the key, right? It doesn't matter. You don't need to do any, be able to do anything because ultimately if you have a will and if you have a desire and you, and, and you basically feel that purpose, you will learn to do those things. And I know that now, you know, my wife didn't speak a link of English and she just wanted to learn and she learned it. And I've seen her do that over and over and over again on different things. So ultimately the festival that I produced with his, he, in all he, he provided his name, and was, I'm not gonna, this isn't about the Shakespeare Festival, but, but in the, it, I will tell you this one last bit. On our way to the festival, um, it took me two years, that was, nine, that was uh, 2004. We had our first festival in 2006, in April. And I remember driving with uh, Dick to the festival in, the, in his old little car, and we we're driving together, and he goes, Michael, now, you know? <laughs> um, you know, you've done a really amazing job, Michael. And, and whatever happens, I want you to know that I'm really proud of you. 